Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. We're delighted to have you here. My name is John Hamry. Uh, I'm the president at CSIS. And I can't tell you how uh, heartened I am uh, to see so many people that want to be here this afternoon to talk about NATO. Uh, I'll be perfectly honest. I, I was afraid we weren't going to be able to attract such a strong interest in this topic because, frankly, America has been kind of asleep for the last several years on NATO. And uh, when we had this opportunity to partner with General uh, Palmieros, we said we need to do something to start to reinvigorate an alliance that's still fundamental to America's interests. It isn't something that we talk about very much. And it isn't something that, that is a central focus of our security deliberations. It once was, but we, uh, America's ultimately, we're pragmatic and we go wherever the problems are immediately, yet we should be looking at the fundamentals of the resources that we have with us. And this alliance is the most important fundamental resource we have. We're very fortunate that, uh, that we have political leaders. Let me just say, NATO is always, people say, you know, it's the most successful military alliance in history. Ultimately, it's a political alliance. It's a political alliance that has a direction. And ultimately, it's about the coherence of our political agenda, this transatlantic political agenda. That's the foundation of the success of this alliance. And that means we have to link together both the foreign policy dimensions and the security dimensions of this alliance. And I'm so very grateful that Senator McCain and Senator Murphy were willing to take time. I'll tell you, give you a warning right now, there are votes that are starting at 5.30. So we're gonna press right into this. But I do wanna say how grateful I am to them for their leadership in the, in the Senate, their leadership for our country, and their presence this afternoon to help us launch this series. Uh, I don't know which of the two of these brilliant women are gonna start this, but I'll turn it to you. But just would you all with your applause, please welcome and thank these two senators for being here. Thank you to everyone for coming today, Senators. If you can um, turn your mics on, if you're uh, able to now. Um, I'm Dr. Kathleen Hicks. I run the International Security Program, and I'm pleased to be here with my colleague, um, Ms. Heather Conley, who runs the Europe Program here at CSIS. We're going to spend about a half an hour or so speaking with the Senators, and then we're going to open it up for some um, questions and answers. Uh, let me begin with a very open-ended question to both of you, and maybe we'll start on the outside with Senator McCain. Um, NATO is approaching yet another summit. Uh, we are at a crossroads, as we always say, but at this time we certainly have one in terms of the Afghanistan mission. There are significant concerns about where NATO is going in terms of the funding. Um, the U.S. is rebalancing to the Pacific. With all of these different factors at play, what are you seeing that gives you the greatest hope and the greatest concern with regard to the, the alliance? Well, I'm trying to think <laughs> the you greatest want to go hope. To <laughs> <laughs> uh, could I thank CSIS and John Hamry, who I've had admiration for and appreciation for for many years. He, he had humble beginnings on the Senate staff and fortunately has forgotten that unpleasant experience and has gone on to doing great things as CSIS has, and I'm very happy to be here. I think probably the greatest hope is the fact that it remains a viable, uh, ever-inclusive. I think we have reasonable candidates for uh, growth uh, of NATO. I think it remains a force for stability in the world. Um, um, and, I, and I think that despite our com complaints that we have that are justified but annual about the amount of funding, and I'm sure we may talk about that in the future. There's only two countries, Poland and Norway, that have increases in, in spending. Um, it still remains one of the most remarkable and enduring uh, phenomena of the 20th and now 21st century. Um, and people all over the world look to NATO as both a model and an inspiration. And any other alliances, I think, will be based on, on that model. 
My greatest concern, we go back to spending. We also go back, I think, to reluctance on the part of NATO, and which is a reflection of the countries that they represent, from getting involved anywhere to do anything. Um, I appreciate what happened in Libya, and I think it was uh, quite impressive that we were able to take out Muammar Gaddafi without committing troops on the ground. But when I see what happens in Syria, when I see um, ranging from Mali to uh, a number of other countries throughout the Middle East, and we see, uh, frankly, our Secretary General seems to be compelled every morning to get up to tell the world, under no circumstances will NATO be involved in anything. I don't know where he got that disease. Um, then it does worry me about the viability of NATO and whether they will ever again intervene. Example, I'm not saying that NATO should intervene in Syria. It was 8,000 people were ethnically cleansed in Srebrenica and that moved the President of the United States and NATO to intervene there. And I think in retrospect, all of us, and by the way, it was a hell of a debate in the Senate, uh, in retrospect, we're all glad we did it. The last few days, 11,000 people have been documented to be tortured, murdered, starved to death, and there hasn't even been a comment, much less any concern on the part of our European friends and NATO partners. That's very disturbing to me. Well, thank you to John and CSIS for having me as well. It's really an honor to be here with Senator uh, McCain in my new role as chair of the Europe Subcommittee on Foreign Relations. I'm learning a lot uh, from uh, John and, and others. Um, I won't endeavor to recite again what I think Senator McCain has laid out as the uh, successes here. This is the model for common defense. Um, it's uh, not a coincidence that there's still a long line of nations seeking to join NATO because it still offers tremendous benefits. Um, I don't, I think the greatest overused word in Washington and diplomatic circles is pivot these days. Still, when there is trouble anywhere around the world, the first place the United States turns is to our NATO allies and they are the first to respond. Um, I would add um, a couple additional concerns to those that have been raised by Senator McCain. Clearly, funding is at the top of the list, uh, as is the willingness of European nations, given tight budgets, to step up to the plate and make the um, uh, resources available. But I I'll add two new ones, which is first the um, issue of integrating uh, our counterterrorism work um, into the mission of NATO. Um, now, we've seen, obviously, a major dust-up over the revelations regarding U.S. surveillance techniques, but it has, frankly, I, I think, um, forced us to talk a little bit about what our true counterterrorism partnership is going to be and whether it's going to simply be on individual bilateral bases, whether it's going to go through e the EU, or whether it can be a more central organizing premise of NATO going forward, which also speaks to the second challenge, which is as the EU stands up, um, a greater ability to speak with a common voice on the issue of national security and defense, I will tell you, it is likely going to become even more problematic for uh, the United States to figure out whether the proper venue for an individual conversation about the future of national security is better housed in NATO or better housed in the EU. Um, and so the ability of th this triumvirate of the United States, the EU, and the NATO to figure out a new communication strategy moving forward, I think is one of the um, challenges, but frankly, a an opportunity as well, because uh, the EU is gonna bring capabilities to unite um, Paul and Mill together um, that maybe right now um, aren't available to us when we're simply talking to NATO or through NATO. Could I just make a comment? Um, I admire uh, Senator Murphy a lot and he and I shared a memorable experience not long ago when we went to Ukraine and were present at Maidan Square to watch a couple of 300,000 people demonstrating for a, a country that is free of Russian influence and can be part of the European community. 
It's a rem and I don't know what's going to happen there, and things are very tenuous, but it was a remarkable experience for us to, to be able to see that incredible uh, outpouring of people in weather that's like it is today here. And, and notwithstanding the somewhat tortured history of the Ukraine with NATO and the EU, um, the desire of the Ukrainian people to have a European-facing future is a manifestation of the success of both the EU and of NATO. So you want to talk about the success that NATO has delivered. It, it, it is present um, on the streets of uh, Kyiv and uh, throughout uh, the Ukraine today. I promise you, it was not about joining the EU. It was about being a European nation, whether it be the music, whether it be the culture, whether it be the economy, whether it be getting rid of corruption. It's because they are making that desire manifested in a, in a way that has sacrificed already uh, a rather large amount. Well, you both segued beautifully into the next question, which was going to be uh, Ukraine. Senator Murphy, when, when you both were on Maidan in December and speaking to the protesters, you said to the Ukrainian uh, protesters, you are making history. If you are successful, the United States will stand with you every step of the way. How does the U.S. tangibly support Ukraine during these difficult days? I'd love your reflections on that and really what we've been witnessing over the last 28, 48 hours. And then the second part of my question to you both, and Senator McCain, you mentioned the growth of NATO enlargement. Uh, Secretary Clinton said in Chicago uh, in 2012 that Chicago would be the last summit which is not an enlargement summit. There is real concern that the summit in Wales will not address enlargement. What, what does NATO signal to Georgia to Ukraine, to those countries that do want to come into NATO, but yet NATO politically is exhausted and may not see where enlargement fits into the picture. I'd welcome your reflections on both Ukraine and enlargement. Well, I'll take the first stab on two big topics, um, but uh, you know, I've, I've had a fairly short diplomatic uh, history, uh, but I've never seen anything uh, like what I saw uh, in the Maidan that uh, afternoon. Um, we had the chance, after speaking to a, about a half a million to a million people, to then have a meeting with a small group of some of the young leaders of the movement. And um, as Senator McCain said, it was really remarkable because um, as much as there is a giant portrait, at least when we were there, of Yulia Tymoshenko in the square, this is largely a non-political gathering, a group of largely young people, but frankly representing a cross-section of Ukrainians who um, just want... Uh, control of their government, a feeling that um, their will is expressed uh, in the halls of leadership, that there's clean government, um, that it isn't just a means to enrich uh, political leaders and their friends and cronies. Um, it was a remarkable place to be. The question you asked is, what does the U.S. do here? And listen, I think we have to admit um, that there are limited tools that the United States has, and there are some expectations that it, it's the United States that's going to deliver the salvation for the Ukrainian people. Um, that may be too high a bar, but there are definite things we can do. We can speak with a clear voice, and I think that we have done that in this situation, perhaps better than we, than we have in others. Um, uh, our assistant secretary was on the ground in the Maidan as soon as it was probably possible to do so. Senator McCain and I were there to deliver a bipartisan message. We passed a resolution uh, in the Senate expressing our clear sentiments to stand with the Ukrainian people. Um, and we have begun to use some fairly serious diplomatic tools uh, like visa uh, restrictions um, that uh, may send an even clearer message to the regime. I think all of that... <coughs> that unanimity of, of, of sentiment coming from the highest ranks of the United States government has had an impact on the situation on the ground. Um, on the issue of enlargement, I know that people are worried um, that some high expectations may not be met. And when you go through the list of countries, there's an individual reason why each country may not be where they wanted to be uh, a year or two ago, whether it be the name issue in Macedonia or the continued security concerns uh, on the borders of Georgia. But um, we should continue to keep our eye on the prize here, because if you have 
um, a series of summits that don't add to the membership, then it has a chilling effect on those who would want to be part of NATO. And of course, this is a much bigger issue than just uniting in a common defense. This is about a signal that these nations send to the world when they join one of the most reputable, esteemed uh, political and military bodies that they are ready for economic prime time as well. And so we want to be able to keep that light shining. Strong statement by our Secretary of State. Victoria Newland did and continues to do an outstanding job. It's hard for us Americans to understand how important it is to these people, the backing and support of the United States of America, its government and people. We had a hearing on the Foreign Relations Committee on Ukraine. I was in Davos, met with several of the people who are in the resistance, one of them a disaffected oligarch, and he said, uh, you know, the hearing in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee came up at 4 a.m. and all of us watched it. And I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <and> so <clears throat> anyway, but the point is, it matters to them, just as it mattered when Ronald Reagan said, tear down this wall, just as it mattered when President Reagan mentioned Nathan Shransky's name and it ver reverberated throughout the Gulag. It matters to these people that, that the United States of America, Republican and Democrat, executive and legislative branch, speaks out in, in their behalf. One of the most moving things in my life, and I've had a long life, was when Chris and I were standing there and these hundreds of thousands of people began ch chanting, thank you, thank you, thank you. It was very moving. So we, we cannot underestimate the importance of the moral suasion of the United States of America and, and our allies. What I would like to see is the EU be, they've been kind of back and forth, they have not been steadfast, they've sort of backed off, and then I, I, I would like to see a commitment from the EU to say, look, if A, B, and C happens, you're in. And the same way with the IMF. Um, I don't think, frankly, we've seen as much of a commitment from the EU as, as, we, as we might um, uh, there. So I, th I think that's very important. In, in NATO enlargement, look, I, I have a special feeling for Georgia. I have a special affection. I was there many years ago in Tbilisi when you couldn't walk down the street in Tbilisi without a security guard because there was so much lawlessness. When Shevard Nazi ran one of the most corrupt <coughs> governments in, in all of Europe. And I watched this incredible revolution that took place and the amazing things that have happened, including a free and fair election, even if that election weren't exactly the result that I may have wanted. But the fact is, they've been pretty good so far. So here we have a country that, frankly, is occupied by Russia, uh, Ossetia and Abkhazia, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, are occupied by Russia. Every once in a while, the Russians move the fence another 100 meters or two. Um, it's, pure, it's clear that Putin views Georgia as he does Ukraine, as he does Latvia, Estonia, uh, and Lithuania as part of the near abroad. And I think one of the really signals that we could send is to move forward with Georgia membership in NATO. And by the way, my friends, they have more troops in Afghanistan as a percentage of their population than any other country in, in the alliance. And they've lost some of them. So I think that we should appreciate already the contributions they have made to NATO before they even were on the path to membership. For um, the countries in Eastern Europe that are NATO members, building on those last points from both of you, they're obviously looking for the substantiation of that U.S. signal of its commitment to the Transatlantic Alliance and, of course, to NATO's signal overall to, of its commitment to the security of Eastern Europe. So I'm wondering if you can each um, provide your thoughts in a period of you know, fiscal challenge for the United States with other competing priorities to include often during times like this we call for U.S. troops to come home as opposed to being deployed abroad. 
I wonder what your thoughts are about what the U.S. could do tangibly to signal to Europe our continuing commitment on the military side. Well, let, let, let me say that this is part of a scenario that's been going on since the early 20th century as far as the Republican Party is concerned. The isolationists come home America, fortress America, versus the internationalists. You could go back <clears throat> prior to World War I, prior to World War II, Lindbergh, the America Firsters, after World War II, the Taft wing of the party, the Eisenhower wing of the party. You could take it all the way up to today, where we have the wing of our party, which is dedicated to cutting foreign aid. If we were at a town hall meeting today and I said, how many um, of you in this room think that 30% of our budget is foreign aid? Most of them would raise their hand and think it's more. And there is a, with hard economic times, there is obviously that tendency to wonder whether we are expending their tax dollars wisely. That debate is going on in the Republican Party right now. And it will play out in the campaign uh, for the nomination of our party. And so we'll have to see. But I would also like to see more presidential leadership as to our America's role in the world. And I would like to see more of us who are in the Republican Party who are internationalists maybe do a better job of explaining that we may want to leave the Middle East, but the Middle East is not going to leave us. And, and that what happens today in, in, in Damascus matters. What happens today in Mali matters. What happens today in, across the broad Middle East as we see the rise of Al-Qaeda and radical Islam who are dedicated to our extinction and when they, and if and when they re obtain the capability to do so, they will attack Europe and the United States. So uh, I, guess what I, I guess what I'm saying is that we need to fight this battle and have this debate openly, honestly, and respectfully. And we've got, and I'm confident we can win again. Uh, John and I have found all sorts of common ground recently, but it'll come to no surprise to him that I came to Congress as someone who ran on the premise of withdrawing from Iraq. Um, and I, one thing I think to be careful of is not to confuse those of us who have come to Congress in the last half a decade on the premise of r reduced roles in places like Iraq and Afghanistan with isolationism. I, in fact, NATO is the exact kind of multilateral partnership that many of us want us to reinvest in. And I think it uh, probably bears repeating that over and over again, because when you hear that the debate in Congress is just about you know, how fast we get out of Afghanistan or whether or not we commit any kind of military resources to Syria, um, it masks the fact that there actually is more support here for the transatlantic military relationship than you may otherwise uh, believe. Um, one could, caught, I, could I interrupt yeah, go, Chris go for one it. more time to add to his point? I forgot to say that Americans are disillusioned because of Iraq, right. and they are don't see uh, the old line Vietnam, the light at the end of the tunnel uh, in Afghanistan, and that has contributed enormously to this withdraw America. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, Your but point is well made. No, but that's, and, and, and that's right. And listen, they, they also, you know, they also understand more than many people may give them credit for that the raison d'etre of the alliance is not there any longer. And so they sort of wonder why do we contribute um, as much as we do when we have a very different threat. Um, and so that, that, those, are, those are challenges but opportunities because despite all of the furor about the new sort of isolationists in the Congress, I think there are plenty of people who still want to engage in this relationship. Um, I would just add one caution to um, something that is often offered as the first panacea to what may ill the relationship, and that's the uh, trade agreement. Um, trade agreement is incredibly important. I, I support it, and I speak as someone who hasn't voted for a lot of trade agreements in my time, and I think this one is um, both economically justifiable but a, a geopolitical game changer. But, but that can't answer the 
questions going forward about the future of our political military relationship. We have big questions that you're going to seek to answer over the course of the next 24 hours on the future of NATO and the future of interoperability and of smart defense. And I hope that we get a trade agreement. But that can't be our only answer because that is not a substitute uh, for the very important military partnership that still has to occur. And it can certainly answer some of the concerns that Europeans have over whether we're still serious about the transatlantic relationship, um, but it can't be the beginning and the end. I think we're turning now sort of south. Senator McCain, you brought us towards Libya, Mali. Um, on Friday morning, we had uh, French Minister Le Drian here, and he gave a, a really, a, I think, a realignment of French strategy towards the Sahel. Um, is, is a NATO southern strategy, some have been writing, Steve Larrabee from Rand and others, that it's time for NATO to more purposefully turn south, that's where the new dangers are. And do you foresee a NATO role potentially even in the Middle East, with new partners with Qatar, UAE? We're, we're seeing a new growth area in the south, and I welcome your comments on that. Well, first of all, I, I think what the French have done in Mali is remarkable. <clears throat> you have to go to Mali to appreciate my military friends, the, the terrain and the heat and the it's really the toughest, very tough place to fight in, and the French have done extremely well militarily, and they're going to stay. They're going to keep, I had a conversation with the French defense minister, they're, they're going to stay. So I, I appreciate very much what the French are, are doing there, and they have largely succeeded so far, although it's a long way uh, from over. Um, we're going to have to look at, at Africa. And we're going to have to look at what's happening all across, although some good news may be in Tunisia. Um, it's, it could be some very good news as to their progress, but Egypt is very depressing. Um, and so I would like to see much more of NATO involvement than just simply uh, French, particularly in the area of training and equipping. If there's anything a lot of these African nations need, it's expertise on border patrol, control, and they also need uh, training and help in the technicalities of, of counterterrorism, no matter which country you look at. And may I just throw in, um, uh, in the second battle of Fallujah, we lost 96 Marines and soldiers, 600 wounded. And now we see our, vehicles driving around Fallujah with the black flag of Al-Qaeda. I know a lot of these people who fought there, and I know some who lost family members. It's pretty hard for me to look them in the eye and tell them that their son's death was not in vain. And it's a total failure of American policy when we withdrew completely from Iraq, and anybody tells you that we wanted to leave a force behind is not telling you the truth, because Lindsey Graham and Joe Lieberman and I were over there when Maliki agreed to have a residual force remain behind. Iraq is now an abject failure, and it's spilling over into Syria, and it's become a haven for Al-Qaeda, and it is an abject failure of American foreign policy and I'm not sure that I can look the parents of those 4,000 brave Americans who gave their lives in the eye and tell them it was worth it because we, in the words of General Petraeus, we won the war and we lost the peace. I think one of the things that um, John said earlier was that if we ignore regional conflicts, ignore um, increasingly ungovernable territories, uh, we and the Europeans do that at our peril. And Africa is probably the best and closest example for the Europeans. And um, what John was saying about training is, is perhaps the most important thing. It's the smallest investment with the biggest return because it is one thing to make uh, small scale temporary investments in trying to quell local disturbances is quite another to um, commit yourself to a much larger scale endeavor. I think Africa though is going to be um, the place where NATO and the EU are going to have to figure out 
um, who leads and the future of their interoperability because you know, reports coming out that we may be seeing a potential larger EU force in the CAR moving forward, which you know, could pay dividends, um, but it will confuse uh, a little bit of the question of leadership uh, as to whether NATO or the EU is uh, going to be playing the leading role in Europe's face and the transatlantic face uh, in, uh, in Africa. I want to conclude our portion before we go out to the audience um, with a question about the State of the Union address, which is, of course, tomorrow night. Um, I'm wondering from each of you, maybe beginning with Senator Murphy, what you would most want to hear in that State of the Union with regard to the NATO alliance or even specifically to the NATO mission in Afghanistan. Well, I think it's important to note as we think about the signals that we can send um, that uh, are maybe more than just symbolic. Um, the president is going to be in Europe and he's going to be in Brussels and um, that I think will be important and we hope that there are some uh, announcements that can come out of that. So uh, I would hope that he would reference that trip and give a little bit of context uh, to it in his State of the Union uh, speech. Um, you know, I, I'm someone who came out very early on and my time in the House of Representatives to uh, say that we should expedite uh, our uh, troop withdrawal from Afghanistan. But um, I do see uh, the merit in continuing to allow for both a training mission and a counterterrorism mission. Um, the suggestion that that has to be a minimum of 10,000 troops, as we've heard in the last mm -hmm. couple of days, that is going to be a hard sell to a lot of Americans um, who I don't think uh, believed withdrawal meant uh, 10,000 troops being uh, left behind. Um, but I think a lot of us want to entertain that conversation about whether we can sell to our constituents that there is a reason to have in the medium term um, some continued uh, mission there. Um, I, I will say though that uh, you know, people, my constituents are just tired. They're tired, and I think that's why you saw this just absolute outpouring over Syria. Um, to me, I always describe it as you know the supermarket moment when somebody is your constituents are so angry about something that they shout out what they believe across the supermarket to you um, because they're that passionate. It's only happened twice: healthcare and Syria, um, in the time that I've been in Congress. But it does speak to the fact that um, if we are going to uh, have uh, some sizable force on the ground in Afghanistan, the president either tomorrow night um, or in some follow-on speech uh, or public relations effort is going to have to give a really good reason to the American public as to why that's absolutely necessary. I agree very much with what Chris had to say. I would like to hear the president emphasize trade agreements, both in both sides of the world. I think it's very important. I think it's kind of sad that we have really not made much progress. And I think this is one of those issues where the president speaking forcefully may be able to overcome some of the parochial interests of some of both Republican and Democrat base. Um, but I'd also like to hear the president talk about his vision for America's role in the world. I'd like to hear him talk about that we don't intend to send Americans in harm, harm's way. We know that the American people are weary and we know they've sacrificed, and, but there are still great dangers in the world. There are great threats to everything we stand for and believe in. And these threats are gonna have to be made, met collectively, or unfortunately, sometimes singly. And it doesn't mean, as I say, bombing or sending troops uh, on the ground because Americans, as Chris said, are, are not uh, ready to do that. But there's so many ways that we can be involved and engaged and we should exercise every one of those options. If all of North Africa goes, and it won't, but if the, the slaughter drags on in Syria and the Syria-Iraq area becomes, a, as it is now, a base for Al-Qaeda, if, if Egypt becomes, is, and I, I predict right now it will, become a base, uh, it will become insurgency. You can't alienate 30% of the population the way that they have and not expect more and more bombs to go off as went off uh, the other day, that we, we can exercise a lot of moral suasion and a lot of leadership. And frankly, when we do it and as NATO or in conjunction with our European friends, 
it has all the more impact. We still stand for all those things that America is all about. And finally, our interests are our values, and our values are our interests. And when we betray that simple slogan, we eventually pay a very heavy price for it. And I would like to hear the President talk about not only the obligation, but the privilege of being still the most important nation in the world. And let me add one thing. He's, and, and he, he will cover this, but um, he, of course, has to talk about the issue of counterterrorism surveillance. Um, and he has a message clearly that he's going to first and foremost deliver to the American people about a new path forward. Um, but I hope that he spends uh, at least a few moments, a sentence or two, delivering a message to our European partners as well. Clearly there was a portion of his speech dedicated to that. Some of us would have liked to have seen it go a little bit uh, further. But if we don't get this relationship right, if we don't figure out the future of counterterrorism and surveillance activities between the United States and our European allies, um, then all of our other defense cooperation is rendered virtually meaningless. And um, what is important here is that if he delivers that message, then we deserve to expect some honest responses. And, and I don't think we have gotten that in every uh, case. Um, there's, as we know in this room, a lot more cooperation happening than our European partners and leaders would uh, let on. And if we're willing to come to the table and say that we're willing to give European citizens new rights, that we're willing to uh, look at political espionage in a fundamentally different way, then we need our partners to also uh, admit that strong uh, counterterrorism, uh, properly monitored surveillance programs are just as much in the Europeans' interests and their constituents' interests, their citizens' interests, as it is in our citizens' interests as well. But we will never listen in on Angela Merkel's phone again. Ever again. <laughs> Ever again. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Senators, I, I hope Kath and I were a good warm-up act because the tough questions are about to come. Now we're ready to turn to our audience. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, and I'd ask, uh, we have microphones, I'd ask that you wait for that microphone to come, identify yourself, please no comments, let's go straight to questions so we can get some good answers. But before we begin, I'd like to turn to Deputy Supreme Allied Commander uh, Transformation, General Palermas, who's going to say just a few words, and if we just could bring the microphone up and uh, turn to the General, thank you. I'm very happy to be the Supreme Allied Command Transformation, but my deputy is here. Yeah. He's much taller than me, by the way, much stronger. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Senators, uh, for two, two reasons, at least. First and foremost, for your wonderful support for our people in harm ways in many places in, in this world. They fully appreciate uh, strong, your strong political uh, will and commitment. Uh, we are very proud in uh, Allied Command Transformation to be present, the, a visible presence in, of NATO here in the U.S. And uh, we, we strive really to not only to keep but to develop the transatlantic bond, as we call it, and the, the, the forum that we organize with, uh, co with CSIS tomorrow called the Transatlantic Forum is there to, to do that and to, I would say, propose uh, a new perspectives on, uh, on this transatlantic bond uh, to in line with the future summit. The, the second point is really how much uh, we appreciate uh, how you launched this uh, transatlantic forum with uh, a, a great contribution and with a very candid approach to uh, NATO and I would say security problems at the world. Uh, we could argue about uh, the role of NATO which cannot do everything and, and nothing. But uh, since 65 years, I would suggest that NATO has been very successful and our narrative is not as good as NATO was during the 16, 65 years. This is the first point. Secondly, uh, NATO is about consensus and th that would be my question. Would you say that today NATO is a point of consensus in your Congress? That NATO, that NATO is is a point of contention. Contentious or consensus? Well, uh, I mean, I don't, have, I don't have the necessary perspective here, but I think the worry is not that it's an issue of contention. The worry is uh, that it is an issue that is vanishing from conversation. And so we need to, there, there, there frankly just needs to be some elementary education that is done um, of new members of Congress as to the importance of this relationship. Um, I, I don't, I think our people, is there some anxiety over the, 
uh, fact that the United States is now contributing you know, somewhere in the range of 75% of overall costs, a absolutely. Is there some anxiety over some of the issues that have occurred within the alliance over counterterrorism operations? Yes, but um, I, I think that for, um, uh, for, for members of Congress who have come here in recent years, that um, there just needs to be some basic instruction as to the importance of, uh, of this alliance. Yeah, the, again, the only concern, I think, is with sequestration and continued reductions across the board. Remember that defense bears a disproportionate share because when they did sequestration, they exempted a lot of other branches of government, that it's going to put a strain on our ability to, to bear as much of the burden as we do uh, financially. Um, I, th I think the Libyan experience was instructive in many ways. It showed that there was a lot of good capabilities that NATO had, but it also showed that NATO was lacking in a whole lot of areas, including numbers of weapons, including refueling capabilities, including uh, reconnaissance capabilities, including a lot of areas that were revealed as, as being sorely lacking even in a relatively short conflict as was Libya. And we ought to take a lesson from that. So um, I, I, there's good, I would agree with, I think there's good will towards NATO, but we do need to maybe take our, some of our newer colleagues traveling that haven't had much experience because there's nothing like being there to really focus the mind and so, we look forward to coming to Brussels and, and uh, visiting with a lot of our allies. I, I, I sort of explain it this way. If you've been in Congress in the last 10 years, um, but let's take just the, you know, most of Congress has only been there for the last six years. Um, this has been a time of enormous economic strain, and so your constituents force you to spend the vast majority of your brain thinking about domestic subjects. It's been a time of two wars committing um, tens of thousands of American soldiers. And so the portion of your brain that you can reserve for foreign affairs is spent on Afghanistan and Iraq. And oh, by the way, you have to spend a little bit of time, right, thinking about the Middle East as well. So you have to know that issue. Just hasn't left a lot of room um, amidst a time of great domestic economic turmoil to think about the transatlantic relationship. So here's our opportunity. The opportunity is that the economy is getting better slowly. Um, both wars are over or winding down. A trade agreement now is forcing people to think about the importance of the relationship as it uh, has to do with our economic security moving forward. And so um, as much as we can regret the fact that there hasn't been a lot of focus here, this is a moment at which um, the, the oxygen that each member of Congress has is now available in a little bit larger way for this conversation. Thank you. Okay, let's take three questions. Uh, we will have one there, please. Microphone is coming your way. And we'll just, we'll bundle them. So we'll take the first one and we'll move around. Right there. Uh, Meto Koloski. Uh, Senators, thank you very much for all of your leadership on foreign policy in the Congress. In a recent op-ed for The Hill, I argued the role of Congress in the name uh, dispute between Macedonia and Greece. Uh, both of you are attending the Munich Security Conference, and uh, Ambassador Ischinger has encouraged both Greek and Macedonian prime ministers to meet to discuss uh, their differences to resolve them in order to get Macedonia into NATO and EU. What do you suggest, and can you make some encouragements to both sides to finally resolve their differences? Wonderful, and we have a question right. right here, please. Thank you. Resolve their differences. Resolve their differences. Just Thank you. Uh, Senators, I think you make a great bipartisan panel, and I appreciate your time with us today. My name is Eric Tamerlani. I work for the Friends Committee on National Legislation. I prepared this question earlier, so pardon my reading off a piece of paper. But um, earlier this month, former Air Force Chief of Staff General Norton Schwartz stated that without financial buy-in from NATO, uh, money for the F-35 nuclear integration with the B-61 tactical nuclear bomb should probably realign to other priorities. In the recent omnibus, uh, it actually cut funds for an F-35 nuclear capability, and it seems that the U.S. is moving away from an F-35 nuclear role. So considering that European fighter jets capable of deploying the B-61 right now will be retired, and the F-35 might not be able to carry the B-61, our NATO partners won't be able to deliver that bomb um, in the future. 
and carry out their nuclear mission. So I'm wondering, should our NATO allies, as General Schwartz talked about, financially contribute to modernizing the B-61, or should the U.S. eventually remove the B-61 from Europe? I think we had one question over there. Please go. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Oliver Grimm. I'm the correspondent for the Austrian newspaper, Die Presse. Uh, a quick question to both gentlemen. Could you um, give us your, your verdict of the first five years um, of that new European position of a uh, high representative for foreign and security matters of Madame Ashton? Uh, what do you expect uh, for her successor? Uh, what do you hope um, in, in filling out that position? Because it wasn't particularly, um, I think, glorious in, in the eyes of many people. Thank you. So we had name recognition issue, F-35, nuclear capability, and your thoughts on the EU high representative for foreign affairs. That's a diverse set of issues. <laughs> <laughs> Who yeah, wants and to I, take a step first? <laughs> yeah, and, I'll, and, and, you know, and I, I, I will claim a lack of information on, on, on uh, at least the, the middle of these topics, except to say that I think on the general issue of um, the future of expense allocation, um, we just are going to have to ask our European partners to do more. Um, we've fixed um, part of the most damaging elements of sequestration so that the Department of Defense is at least going to be able to manage these cuts, but there's no doubt that if we want to commit ourselves to some of the projects that have been planned, um, we can't see 40% reductions in European defense budgets as we uh, have seen. We can't allow for this uh, essentially ethic within the European populace to believe that counterterrorism is just something that the United States worries about. So um, this has got to change. Other than that, you know, Kathy Ashton has a couple um, big notches on her belt uh, so far. The agreement in the Balkans is something she invested an enormous amount of time in. Um, it is not the um, it is not the, the, the end solution there. It's the beginning of a solution uh, for those uh, two countries. And I know there's been some angst as to whether the um, parameters of the agreement have actually played out as expected. And of course, uh, her great long work on trying to keep an open line of communication with Iran is hopefully going to get us to a place in which we have a diplomatic uh, solution. And to your question on Macedonia, you talk about how you get to a point at which you have a enlargement summit. Um, that's the quickest way you get to an enlargement summit because uh, it's likely that that's the only thing standing in the way or the only um, important thing standing in the way of uh, Macedonia joining NATO or at least getting on a pathway to joining. And so uh, I, I take your, your comment seriously and you know, we'll examine this weekend's summit and other uh, venues for uh, a way that we can try to get the two sides to talk a little bit more um, vociferously together. You want to try, Senator McCain? Any, any comments on this? Well, uh, first of all, I do not share my friend's opinion of Catherine Ashton. <clears throat> on the case of Macedonia and Greece, it's just incomprehensible to many of us, even when we are brief time after time and being there, this how important a name is to our Greek friends. And so uh, I, we continue to hope that this will be resolved, but to have the name Macedonia be of such offense to our friends in Greece is something that I, I, I fail to comprehend. I admit maybe I'm not that bright. As far as the F-35 is concerned, it's been one of the great scandals of recent acquisition history. Cost overrun after cost overrun after cost overrun. First trillion dollar weapon system in history. It's finally getting operational but it still is experiencing great difficulties. If there's ever an argument for a comprehensive review of acquisition, of defense acquisition, if there is an, ever an argument that states that this is completely unacceptable to the American taxpayer and makes it difficult for me and people like me who are strong advocates of defense spending when you waste tens of billions of dollars on a weapon system that still is not proven. So we have to have, and God knows we've tried, Carl Levin and I passed a bill a few years ago that was going to reform acquisition in the Pentagon. And now we have the Gerald R. Ford. The Gerald R. Ford is now two billion dollars over, co over original cost. How do I go back to Arizona and tell them that well, what could they do with $2 billion? And so it, it's, it, I don't know whether what we're going to do 
as addressing your specific issue. But I do know this, that we may not have enough F-35s to do it because we still haven't proven their systems. And that is, is a source of embarrassment for me, who is a strong defense advocate. I think we have time for one more question, and I'll have the <clears throat> hand right here. Thank you. This has been a great event. Thank you all. Um, I'm Mitzi Worth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School, and this question is for Senator McCain. What structural changes would we have to make in our civil service system to work for peace overseas? The Defense Department can win the war, but they can't build the peace because they need additional skills. How would you suggest we alter the kind of personnel that would be available for that? I think that, that's an excellent question. As far as uh, our State Department is concerned, I've been very impressed with the men and women who I meet, young men and women who come into, into the State Department and serve around the world. I think Chris would agree, countries that I visit, oh, oh, with rare exception, I'm very impressed particularly with the, with the young men and women who are serving in the State Department. I won't say that about every ambassador who was a large contributor to the uh, campaign, but that is not a, that is a uh, bipartisan disease uh, that uh, these things happen. Um, I think we have to make it more attractive in that I meet a lot of young people who work in the Pentagon and they feel frustrated because they don't see a result of the hard work they put in. I think we may have to look at a better reward system uh, rather than longevity in many of these areas, particularly in the Defense Department, in my view. And finally, I'd like to be able to get tap into some of these very brilliant, incredible geniuses that reside out in California and maybe attract some of them. I think we've, if we'd have done that in the case of Obamacare, we might not have had the difficulties that we had in the, in the rollout. And I have talked to some of them who have, who have said the same thing. So maybe some of this work we need to perhaps contract out, but with what has happened with security and forces in Afghanistan and Iraq, contracting out has gotten a bad name. But I think contracting out to do other tasks might be something we should explore. I, I know the question was for Senator McCain, but I'll use it as an opportunity <laughs> just, to, just to register one of my um, pet peeves, which is I, I think we have seen a large scale outsourcing of diplomacy to the Department of Defense and to our covert agencies. Um, and I know that it is difficult to try to integrate the State Department um, into dangerous places like Iraq and Afghanistan at a time when regions are very unstable. Um, but uh, I, I think it's difficult um, to try to um, build up that kind of diplomatic cap capacity within the DOD in a short period of time. And I would argue that we have handed over um, far too much uh, military and diplomatic authority to our covert agencies, making it very difficult for those of us who sit on important committees like foreign relations, but not on intelligence, to actually figure out uh, what we are doing in places like Pakistan and Syria. And so if we want to have a conversation about putting the power back into diplomacy, I think we have to admit that we have seen a large scale shift in diplomatic activity away from the agency that knows how to do it best. Could I just say that I agree? And a good example of that, of our uh, stove piping, is that we, when we hear from Mr. Snowden, the, you know, the revelations that come out, we're always surprised. We're never briefed <laughs> on, the, on Mr. Snowden's uh, revelations. And although that may be confined to the Intelligence Committee, it har hampers our work on the Foreign Relations Committee and on the Armed Services Committee. So I think we ought to, that's one of the problems. And I am not a fan of a lot of the contracting that went out as far as security is concerned. Well, this has been an incredible event for many reasons. It 
very wide ranging, um, but I think also notable for everyone here in the room and those watching um, from beyond the room is how incredibly wonderful it is to see this bipartisan spirit. We at CSIS pride ourselves on our bipartisanship and we often feel very lonely. <laughs> could, I just, could I just point out, if I looked like Senator Murphy, I'd be president of the United States. <laughs> Thank you. Please, everyone, join me in thanking Senator Murphy and Senator McCain for their event today. Well done, buddy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. One statement from me. How should the president uh, tomorrow in his speech address the uh, European partners? 